I was in Senegal in, uh, from 1970 to 1972 in a place called Kedugu, and I think what I remember most of, uh, about that, and that still impacts me to this day, it, are the women. The women were just totally awesome. We had a, pr a special program that we did. It was called an Anamatrice program. And what we did was take two women from each of the uh, communities. There were six communities in the, uh, in the village. They're called Cartiers in, in Senegal. And the women selected two women to represent them. And that, I think, was real neat right there. And, and even though it was a very male-dominated society, the women were very strong in, in, the, in their own right. And so the women would come to our location. We had a little center where we had a, a, a kindergarten. And they would come every day and we would meet and we would talk about uh, health issues. We'd talk about baby care, delivery, things like that. And what I learned from the women was truly how awesome, how strong they were, and how much of, a, of uh, an actual, even though the men were dominant, it was a matriarchal society. And they were, they were just really neat, you know, mm -hmm. it was neat to be around them. Uh, what about you, Richard? What about your situation? Well, well I, I was just going to say, you know, to follow on to that, Mary, it's, it's interesting because most uh, international development today looks at <coughs> women as really the catalyst for development. And there, there's been a shift in the last probably 20 years where, you know, the focus was normally on, on men because they mostly dominated these societies. But most of the aid organizations are now putting the focus on women. But in my own, my own experience, I think w one, or, one or two things that really kind of stuck out the most was how humble, the humility of, of people and their kindness. You know, th these were two things that just really struck me. And, to give you a couple examples, and, and I was in the Solomon Islands, and um, there, was, there was this gentleman standing on the steps of, uh, of the, the hotel this one Saturday morning, and he had his T-shirt on, he had shorts and flip-flops, rubber slippers on, and these Rotarians pulled up, and they saw him standing there, and they, they asked if they, they were coming in from Australia to help with some project, and uh, they asked this gentleman if he would carry his bag, their bags, to the room. So he said, sure. And he grabbed their bags and took them up to the room. And they tried to give him a tip. And of course, there's no tipping in the Solomon Islands. So he left. He, they said, thank you. And he left. And that evening, these Rotarians had a, uh, a dinner function to meet the prime minister. So they go off to this dinner function. And um, they get taken up to the prime minister. <laughs> And of course, who's the prime minister? <laughs> this guy who was standing <laughs> on the steps. So, you know, they were, of course, all very embarrassed. But that was very typical. You know, I've got a similar story where in, in um, Kedugu, actually when I got there, there's a, a, a protocol in, in uh, Senegal, and it's a carryover from the French, I think. Uh, when I got off, the, it was a little plane. It was, a, I think, a little four-seater plane and and when I got to Kedugu there were people there to uh, to greet right mm -hmm. and it, it turns out it's the uh, kind of the the important males of the of right. the community of <laughs> sorry <laughs> <Of course. laughs> and I made a major faux pas I didn't greet the the most important oh, person boy. first but I didn't know who that was mm -hmm. And so I, I shook hands in the in the you know typical mm -hmm. uh, French way and actually did the you know we mm -hmm. kissed each, the right. cheeks, yep. and uh, and I did the wrong person first and talk about my own humility mm -hmm. and having to later kind of undo a little mm -hmm. bit of, of damage mm -hmm. and it was you know I thought at, for a while there oh wow it's going to be a, an international incident here <laughs> because I greeted the wrong person right. first. So I did an apology. I apologized no. and, it, it, uh, and it went through the right channels mm -hmm. and then that was accepted. But it's, it's kind of a different kind of humility, mm -hmm. I, th I think. What about you, Jim? What, did, what were your experiences? What, what did you bring back? I think the thing that struck me most when I was first in Samoa and then in the Solomon Islands, because I didn't get enough of it, so I went twice. Um, <laughs> Every Peace Corps volunteer, his service kind of depends on what he brought with him when he went. Uh, I had grown up in California, went to school in Oregon, and I wound up going to Samoa 
Well, I lived out in a very small village, taught at a small junior high school. At first, I lived with the other Solomon Island, or excuse me, the Samoan male teachers. Um, later on, I moved in with a, a Samoan family and lived with them. In Samoa, you're not allowed to be an outsider. The village sucks you in and you become one of them. Mm -hmm. you're, not, mm -hmm. you're not exempt from being Samoan. So I did that for two years and I got very used to living inside of a village, being a part of the village. When I went to the Solomon Islands, I went to the Solomon Islands back in 75 and 76, so a long time ago. And back then, it was really kind of something out of uh, Kipling or something like that. There was a very distinct British, because it's British Solomon Island protected, very distinct British caste system the 12 Brits on our island had a caste system, and below that were the Melanesians that had their system. And although you might like Melanesians and you might work with them, you still didn't really socialize with them because they were of a different caste. It was, it was very much like watching a BBC program, you know, upstairs, downstairs type of thing. Um, when I got to the Solomons, I went to the island I was on, Malaita, with another Peace Corps volunteer. There were two of us on that island. And he was going to work with small businesses. And his, you know, he fit into this British society. He wasn't <laughs> up there with the, with the king, you know. Mm -hmm. But he was, he was above the English farmer that had been brought over to work on uh, cattle raising in the Solomon Islands. So he fit someplace in the middle. I sat there. My job was to go out and hike around in the jungles and map the island. So I had gotten a uh, uh, Solomon Island um, guide, and I was going to go off on a tour the next day. So my guide comes to the house the night before to knock on the door and tell me, I've come down from the bush, I'm here, I'll see you tomorrow morning. I had just finished cooking my dinner, I just putting it on the table. So this Melanesian guy there with the barefoot and a little loincloth and all this is sitting on my door to tell me that, and you go, well, come on in. And you take your meal and you split your meal into two plates and you put it out and you say, sit down and eat, mm -hmm. you know. And so he sat and he ate with me. And then when he was done eating, you get your little camp bed that the British Army gave you, this little, like a little cot, and you set it up and you say, okay, you'll <laughs> sleep here and tomorrow morning we'll take off. Well, we took off the next morning and we hiked for about two hours into the village, uh, back up into the bush. And the first village we got to, they're already sitting here saying, this fella, white man now, him and get the one fella, black man, him and stop long house belong him. You know, that what, it was. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> God, you know. Uh, I don't know. You <laughs> tell me. They <laughs> what were, does it mean? They were sitting there, and in the time it took Sadias and I to walk two hours to this next village in the bush, mm -hmm. the story had already gotten there that there was some white man mm -hmm. that had had one of the Melanesian guys eat in <laughs> his house and spend the night in his house. This was mm -hmm. such yeah. a weird thing for mm -hmm. them to happen. And I had never thought about it one way or the other. I wasn't trying to make a point. I wasn't trying to do anything. It was just, you do that in Samoa. If somebody mm -hmm. comes through your village and it gets dark, you bring him into the house, you feed him dinner, mm -hmm. and you, without even asking him, you put out a bed for him to sleep mm -hmm. in. You have to, it's required. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I learned that there and I carried it over and it made a, a real wrinkle in the society in the Solomon Islands, because it was different. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are just things that that happened. It was an experience that I picked up from one place and took to another one. I think back on it now, if I had never been in Samoa, I would have been right. sitting in that, my little hierarchy in the white society and saying, okay, this is how the world should be. How is it uh, now back in Hawaii, though? I mean, what, how did, what does that feel like now? I mean, what, is, what does it mean? You remember this as a biggie, you know, as, as mm -hmm. an event, and you do this comparison between the two countries that are the two islands that you're, that you're on, but what does it mean here? Well, you know, you get, you get back, you bring this stuff back with you. I sure. mean, there's, there's two, four years of, of experiences, and you don't leave them behind when you come. And it's very, very hard uh, right now. I mean, just, Hawaii is a nice place where we don't have a lot of arbitrary distinctions between classes, maybe, mm -hmm. as, say, England does. Mm -hmm. Or at least England in that time, or the colonials that I knew did, and I think they still do. Um, we don't have as many, but you still see some of it. You still see some of it where the guys 
on on Bishop Street, you know, the work in the high rises might feel a little bit superior to the guy that's out cutting the grass at the at the local high school. Hmm. Uh, and you, I'm very sensitive to that now, and I'm kind of sitting there going like, you know, what makes anybody feel more superior to somebody well, else? Well, you know, it's kind of like in, in, in Kedugu, it was a very poor village. It was, uh, the way the, the village was, was set up, they, one, it was on the, uh, it was sub-Saharan, so it was either, you know, raining a lot or it was very mm -hmm. hot and dry, and most of the time it was hot and dry, and so food was, was fairly, fairly uh, scarce. I think what I brought back, and you know, it, it wasn't a hierarchy type of thing. What it, what I brought back was coming back to the land of plenty, mm -hmm. right? And I think <laughs> that it, you know, I was over there, didn't have running water, had mm -hmm. a well that sometimes went dry, mm -hmm. uh, had no electricity, mm -hmm. and this is how every, every, everybody everybody lived. They were very generous in mm -hmm. their in their. Uh, sharing with each other, sharing what they had, and it, it was beautiful to watch. But it was a poor economy. It was, it was very poor, and I think, you know, you're talking about the humility before. Mm -hmm. I think what I learned was how wonderful people can be with, the, with each other, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, they're focused on family, they're focused on having children, uh, they're focused on their ground nuts, which was mm -hmm. their main main mm -hmm. main economy. So everything was was made with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but coming back to the United States and seeing back in I, this was 1972 that I came back, seeing big cars, mm -hmm. seeing uh, department stores and things like this. So it was just a, it was a mind change, yeah. and I think that's what I appreciated most and what I brought back was. Mm -hmm was learning uh, to appreciate what I had. Mm -hmm. and, the, and I think, you know, we can all agree that even with the little that these, you know, the people that we've all worked with have, they're happy. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the thing that really stuck out in my mind. I, you know, I mean, I can remember going into villages where people had houses made out of traditional materials. I mean, you know, by our standards, we would consider these shacks. Mm -hmm. but. This was their their home, and and you know they might have a couple uh, pairs of, of you know, a couple outfits, you know, one for Sunday church, and and you know if they had a really good cooking pot, they were happy, you know. Mm -hmm. But but they were but there was this happiness, and as you say, this willingness to share whatever they have, and you know not expect anything in return. It was just incredible, and and another another story I have similar to the to the last one. This Peace Corps friend of mine borrowed a car, and he wanted to go into a, a, a place in town. So he drove into town, and he was going up this hill, and the car stalled. And he was kind of sticking out a little bit, and uh, this car pulled up behind him, and it was this Solomon Islander who got out, pulled over to the side of the road, got out of his car, and he had a, a white shirt and a tie on, you know, so he... Um, he, he was that, somebody important. Well, that was <laughs> obvious. So. He said to Al, he said, you know, do you want a hand? And Al said, yeah, yeah, help me, you know, push the car off to the side of the road. So they pushed the car off to the side of the road. And uh, he goes, well, you know, you need, what else do you want me to do? And Al said, well, oh, no, sorry, they didn't push the car off the road. The two of them couldn't do it. So Al said to him, see if you can go find somebody to help us push the car off to the side of the road. So this guy goes running up this hill, up to this house, and he's knocking on the door, comes back, nobody there. So Al goes, why don't you try over there? So he goes running up this other hill and, you know, comes back to nobody there. So finally he runs up to the other side of the, this, this hill and he gets a couple people and they come and they, they push the car off to the side of the road. And he takes off and Al thanks him and Al runs into him at a meeting a couple weeks later. And he realizes that this was the new Chief Justice of the Solomon <laughs> Islands, oh my and goodness. he was coming from his swearing-in ceremony <laughs> and, and going up to a reception that they were having for him, and he stopped and, and helped Al, and you know, had no problem, you know. Now, but can't you visualize uh, Rehnquist doing yeah, this? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, but you know, again, that was very typical. This this kindness, this you know, oh. wanting to help people and. Doesn't make a difference if he was the Chief Justice of the Solomon Islands or the Prime Minister. They were there and they were willing to help. So, I, you know, and I think that's just such a good example 
for people to follow. It's one of those things that when you come back here, when you're there and living in those villages that, like you say, leaf houses and mm. maybe a cooking pot, maybe not, and a lot of those houses were much more homes than mm -hmm. anything that you see here. Even the million dollar houses that are here aren't quite as much as of home as these people had because there was, there was something inside the house rather than the walls. Um, when I used to go on tour, we'd be gone, gone for three weeks of the month and we, we'd be hiking through the jungle and you would come, it'd be me and Sajis or Leslie, one of my Melanesian guides, and we'd stop at some village and it would be getting late, so we'd ask, and a lot of these villages were just hamlets of one or two houses. We'd say, do you mind if we stay here tonight? Because we didn't carry packs, we didn't carry tents or anything. And over the course of two years, doing that three weeks of the month, I don't know, can't do my math to figure out how many nights that would be. <laughs> Every time we got a place, they would give you a house to sleep in and they would bring you food and they would feed you. And what it was for us is we would sit up there all night with them and talk story. I mean, this was kind of like we were CNN and, you know, and, <laughs> and MNBC at the mm -hmm. same time. We would talk about what it was like in America. We talked about the news we'd heard at the last little village down the line. But all of these places over all of this time, you know, here I am. I must be rich to them. Mm -hmm. But they would give me a place to stay. They would give me food to eat. And they would never, ever ask me for anything. And we'd talk story all night and just be very friendly. And the next day, Sadius or Leslie and I would get up and walk go off on. and go on. Yeah. And people were always really happy to see you. Mm -hmm. And they really enjoyed your company. And not for any benefit that they were going to get out of it. And they were always sorry to see you go the next mm -hmm. morning. Mm -hmm. And it was just a real nice feeling. You know? you know, the other thing that I remember most was the music. Mm -hmm. The music in Kedugo. You know, I look at this drum over mm -hmm. here and, and I remember the, the, the tom-toms, right? And there's any excuse to, to play music and to dance. And so it would be the first drop of rain of the of the year you always they'd go to right. the village square and they'd start right. playing the drums and dancing and everybody would gather and it was again everybody would bring what what little food they would have and they'd share they'd start you know the the fires going and they'd be dancing and they do these uh, really cool dances in, in circles and, mm. and then somebody had to get into the middle mm. and do, do a dance. It was, it was truly awesome. Mm -hmm. It was, I think that, you know, the, mm -hmm. you said happy people, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I think that uh, the people of Kedugu were mm -hmm. extremely happy and uh, even through all of their hardship, yeah. they found something to be happy about. Mm -hmm. It was the first drop of rain. It was somebody's baby. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was... Yeah. Some, a village or somebody from an outlying village vi visiting, mm. for example. I think that uh, mm. the happiness, mm. I have that memory and just mm. real fond memories mm. of that. I don't think we ever celebrated the first drop of rain in the solid. It was pretty amazing mm. because it would be so hot and so dry in, in Kedugu mm -hmm. and that, that big event. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then of course it would, it would be a few drops of rain right. then yeah. the second drop of rain. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I can remember when I arrived to a, we actually Jim was in the Solomon Islands before me, and Long uh, before him. and I my the group that I was in we did the first village stay where you actually went into a village and you learned the, you know they had uh, language teachers mm -hmm. there in the village and you learned about the culture and stuff, and each each of us lived with a family, but the uh, the village that they selected as the first village for the village stay was a what they called the Moro village. It was a cult village based on this religion that was developed by this individual who supposedly died and came back to life and while he was dead had this vision of preserving culture. So everything revolved around preserving culture and they all wore traditional grass skirts, the women of course, and the men just the loincloth. And they had a big, a big house in the middle of the village full of artifacts and stuff. That was one part of the the, the, uh, the cult. The other part was the cargo cult side of it, mm. where in the middle of the village was a big half-built warehouse that they were waiting for the cargo to come back because during World War II, they had seen uh, you know soldiers marching up and down the beach and then all of a sudden these ships would arrive and all this stuff would come off. And, and there were quite a few cults that revolved around this, but this one particular one was kind of 
interesting because it had the two aspects. It had the, you know, the preserving the, the traditions and culture on one hand, and then it was looking for all the modern cargo to come. Mm -hmm. But uh, when we arrived in the village, uh, we had to cross this river. And I'll never forget, you know, here are the seven of us trying to cross this river with all these river stones, and we couldn't get across. So they sent the little kids to come across <laughs> and hold our hands to take us across this river. And we get to the other side, there's 300 villagers, all dressed in traditional clothing. And I'll tell you, it was just, you know, it was just something out of National Geographic that, that uh, was really uh, made an impression. And the welcoming ceremony they gave for us, again, was kind of interesting because I was a couple nights later, they actually had a, a formal welcoming ceremony where they had this choir. And it was the only time I'd seen any of the villagers dressed up in Western clothing. You know, they wore white shirts and black trousers, and they sang some Christian hymns. And then, uh, then they had us sit on a log, all seven of us. And, and similar to what you were saying about Samoa, they gave us each a, a piece of shell necklace, which then allowed us to enter the village at any time. We became pretty much a member or accepted by the village. And then all 300 people in the village passed in front of us on their knees, starting with the oldest man to the, old, to the youngest male down, to, starting with the oldest female down to the youngest, passed in front of us on their knees and shook our hands, and, and that was our welcoming ceremony. Wow. Yeah. That's a pretty awesome welcome. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, was very, very interesting. Yeah. And then, of course, living in this village where mm. people were following uh, traditional, traditional practices, yeah, yeah that, was, that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, because uh, after my Peace Corps service a long time, I, I brought my wife and son back to mm -hmm. go hike through the jungles of Malay to, to see what I had done and uh, show them. And one of the hardest parts is um, we, w we went with my wife, my one-year-old son, my uh, landlady at the time, she wanted to go too, and Leslie, one of my guides from the Solomons, he came with us. And so we were hiking back through the jungles again on this six-week trip. How was Termine. it with a one-year-old? That must have been an experience <laughs> in and of itself. Well, he had a great time because he had one of those little seats, you know, sure. and, and so Dad or Uncle Leslie carried sure. him the whole way, you know, and uh, the only uh, food we carried was baby food jars for him. <laughs> but, uh, you know, because we, like, counted on the people, and we'd stay at the people's houses. But it was funny because it was always hard to leave a village because everybody in the village would line up, and you would have to walk down the line and shake everybody's hands from, like you say, the oldest all the way down to the youngest. And everyone was going, ta-ta, 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 ta-ta. And I never could figure out, you know, okay, was this Koyo, Korai, Ariari, Tobatan, Fatalakan, Baigu, Bailele? What language was this? And I finally realized it then must have been from, from when the English would go up and say, ta-ta, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Someplace just in the middle of the bush, out, just way out of all perspective. It didn't belong there. It's sort of there. like yeah. in, in Senegal and Kedugu, it doesn't, or any place in that part of Africa, every, everybody would, ça va? Ça va? They may not speak any, say right. anything else, right. but ça va, it's, what, what, it's, what, what, the, it's the greeting, everything okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. oh. But it, it it really struck me then, you know, how friendly all these people were. Mm -hmm. And they, they, like when we get to a village, my son's feet never touched the ground. Uh, we'd get there, and the little kids would come up, and they'd pick him up, and they'd be gone. And we'd be in the house, and then just about dark, some little kid would come up and deposit him back in the house. And, you know, mm -hmm. it was just a, it was a, mm -hmm. it was a really interesting uh, time mm -hmm. show. My favorite trip used to be to Bologna. It was a, one of the Polynesian islands in the Solomon Islands. And it was quite a, quite a trip. If you went by boat, it was a couple days trip. If you went by plane, it was two or three hours. But I'll never forget the, the family I stayed with. I stayed with the, the, the local nurse and her husband. And every morning it was lobster, crayfish, <laughs> of course, wow. you know, for breakfast. And, you know, I think I just mentioned that I liked, you know, crayfish or, or the local lobster. And every morning there was a, a nice one or two lobsters mm. <laughs> boiled up for breakfast for me. So, see, so, you know, that was it was nice. Um, you know, in, in um, Senegal and Kedugu, the you eat out of a communal mm -hmm. bowl. So you have uh, it's usually made out of a, a gourd, mm -hmm. and you would have rice or a, a grain, and and then possibly fish or some type of, of meat, and. When you would eat with a, you know, with with a family, 
you'd be the kind of the the guest, right? The honored mm -hmm. guest, right. and so they'd be shoving food, Towards you know, your, the the your side? Yeah. yeah, to my <laughs> side, and I of course would look at the fish eyes right. or whatever it was <laughs> and try to shove it back or or just eat it <laughs> yeah. and it was uh it was it was that was a cool experience that was just the again the just all the the sharing so it was really fun talking about our mm. shared experiences uh, so anyway hey well okay. hey thanks thanks Mary. <laughs> thank you again for joining us for another segment of bring the world home a production of the return peace corps volunteers of hawaii Today's program, we've had the chance to see a variety of the similarities that exist in many different cultures around the world. We invite those of you who are interested in finding out more about Peace Corps service to contact the Peace Corps through your local telephone, online at www.peacecorps.gov, or through this program at the contact information that you see at the end of your show. Thank you for joining us.